I am not pleased that I'm following that incredible talk by Lee, but because uh, we're going to go real nerdy here, real, real nerdy. Um, but hopefully you guys uh, will learn a little bit of something new because um, this is sort of still in concept form. Some I've been thinking about for a while um, and it's perfect for just a quick little lightning talk. So let's start with this chart here, um, which is basically the roughly the number of developers per language in the world. And as you see on the far right hand side, JavaScript is crushing them all. And I often wondered to myself, like, why? Why was JavaScript the one that was so successful? We all know it has many, many faults and foibles. Why was it JavaScript? Um, real quick, this is me, once again. These are some open source libraries you guys can go check out. Um, but I'm, I'm not going to spend my time on that right now. Okay, why was JavaScript so successful? Uh, you know, we've got almost 20 million JavaScript developers out there. I think the real reason is the browser, right? I think we all kind of know this. This is, this is why it mattered so much, because JavaScript was the only language that could actually run in the browser. So if you're going to, if that's, a, you know, a captured market, the, the browser, then obviously it's going to be interesting to run that other places, which is how you end up with Node and all these other things. And so now you have a language that can run in the browser and not in the browser. And that's truly interesting. But did you know that that actually changed in 2017? In 2017, pretty much every major browser started shipping support for another runtime called Wasm or WebAssembly. And WebAssembly is, well, I'll give you my definition of it. It's a virtual stack machine specification. Doesn't sound uh, particularly interesting, so let's just unpack that a little bit. First of all, it's a virtual machine. We kind of all know what virtual machines are because we use Docker and things like that. Well, Wasm is essentially the same thing. It's a virtual machine, which is important because it means it's hardware independent. You can build it once and you can theoretically run this anywhere. Also, it's something called a stack machine, which I'd be surprised if any of you know about. Um, it's not something that we think about on a daily basis. Even low-level programmers don't really think about this on a daily basis. But if you were to, if you were to uh, imagine in your mind sort of the, the Allen Turing, Turing machine and, and how these things operate, there, you need a computational model for how to do basic computations. Any basic computations need a model for it. So, you know, Alan Turing had this idea of like an infinite tape where you would go to different cells and then you could add or subtract a particular operation. Um, a stack machine is another one of these. They used to actually build hardware out of it. I don't know why they chose this as the computational model for Wasm, but they did. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. And finally, it's a specification, which is also interesting because that means that this is not um, a, an implementation. It's more an idea that everybody agreed upon. So there are lots of implementations now of Wasm runtimes. So, you know, in the, in the Node world, we have Node.js, and we've kind of started to dabble with additional runtimes. We've got Dino, and now we've got Bun. Um, but in the, and what, winter something? Um, but in the Wasm world, there's actually already a lot of these. There's like a lot of implementations of Wasm runtimes. So what does this uh, actually look like? Well, it looks like this because fundamentally this is binary. Um, unlike JavaScript, this is actually a compiled binary that you ship to the browser and will execute in the browser. So obviously, I, this is an actual program right here. Um, I don't expect you to be able to read it, but if we were to then, you know, just take this and in Wasm, everything is eight bits uh, per byte. So let's look at what that would look like in hex. Um, still not super useful, although you can start to maybe do some pattern recognition on that in your brain. I see some 64s in there. And if you know your, uh, your ASCII codes, you might know that some of those are actually ASCII characters. And so now this is starting to look a little bit like code, but we still don't know what all these dots are because they're not in the ASCII ranges. So we can use a tool that's put out by the WebAssembly team called Wabbit. And uh, Wabbit uh, basically lets you run a little CLI command. You can give it your WASM file, that big chunk of binary, and it will actually turn this into human readable code. It's like a reverse compiler. And this is what it looks like. So this is the code of that program. All those ones and zeros compile to this. And the cool thing is this is sort of human readable, but you can actually label these things better and you can make it quite human readable. Um, all of the things in here that you see that are dollar signs are really just indexes. They're like zero or one, but you can rename them. And if you look at this, it's kind of 
surprising how it actually uh, is really understandable. Like here we have a function, right? We all kind of know what a function looks like. And you can see here that it's exporting something called add. This is how you get something from this binary into JavaScript. So in this case, we have an add function that you can actually call from JavaScript and, and you can run it from JavaScript, but it will execute in the Wasm uh, virtual machine. This function is taking two parameters, A and B. They're both signed. Um, as i32s, which if you've done uh, any sort of like low-level programming, you know this is a 32-bit integer. And it's going to return a 32-bit integer. And this is where we get into this whole stack machine thing. So I'm getting my two numbers. And the idea of a stack machine is that you add things to the stack. So you can kind of visually represent this in your mind here, right? We've just taken the i32 from parameter A, and we pop it onto the stack in the body of our function. And then we do the same with B, and it pops onto the stack. And then you can call a command, and this command will consume the things that are in the stack, and it will return a value back onto the stack. And then whatever's left at the end of my function execution is the return value of my function. So, this simple little ad is, is relatively easy to follow. Obviously, that's not a computational model that you would want to write all the time yourself, but it's not that understand, like, not understandable. Like, we were able to kind of, under, I think you guys hopefully all kind of understood that just, you know, in one minute of looking at it. And so, uh, if you then take this file that we just wrote, so our ad function, you can use an inverse of our decompiler. This is the actual compiler. You take the WebAssembly text format that we just wrote, you call Watt to Wasm on it, and what pops out the other side is an actual binary. And this binary file can be executed in your browser. So there's basically three ways to do this. Like here's one, you can, you can actually just use a fetch command where you go and fetch the Wasm file, and then you run it in the browser. So here you can see you're getting an instance back, then you look into the exports, the exports has any of the functions that you've exported, and then you can call them. Um, another way to do it, if you're using Vite, is uh, you can use this little uh, import statement with a query init, and it will do all of that weird wasmy stuff for you, and um, just give you a function that you can call that returns a promise to the instance. Um, and this makes it much, much easier to, to do. Um, but one of my favorite ways is actually to base64 encode the application. So this is the same application right here, um, that chunk of code. And this is just base64 encoded. And then we're using um, a, a, um, a uint8 array in order to translate that back into the uh, original character codes. And then we can use the WebAssembly instance to boot it up and run it. And the cool thing about this is that you could actually ship this in a library, for example. Like, let's say that you, you were shipping a library to, to the world and you wanted to like give it a little bit of extra juice, some extra performance on a hot path. You can actually embed the Wasm directly into your JavaScript file and run it this way. You're gonna pay some execution cost for the boot up of that, but if it's, if it's in the hot path of a runtime, it might well be worth it. So why would we actually do this uh, in the real world? So most of the Wasm world right now is, is excited about this fact right here. You can take any of these languages, popular languages like Rust, C, C++, even Go, and you can basically compile them to Wasm, and then you can ship it to any browser. So this has unlocked essentially a whole new category of developer. The developers who previously couldn't write for the web or didn't know how now can, and they can do it. You can literally write uh, front-end code <laughs> using Wasm uh, in a framework like or uh, using Rust in a framework like Leptos or something like that. But maybe even more, the world is even more excited about the fact that this is essentially the Docker machine that we've always wanted. You now have a runtime that can run platform independent on literally any OS, any platform, and you can compile to it a single time because it's so low level that the performance implica implica uh, implications of, of that virtual machine are almost negligible because it's so close to actual machine code. But what I think is really interesting is I like JavaScript, I wanna write JavaScript, and I want JavaScript to run in my browsers, but there are times where I just want a little bit of extra superpowers. Um, and I think that that is what's really interesting. So you can imagine some use cases would be like any, anywhere in your application that is a super hot path. 
In other words, it's getting pounded by the code a lot. It's doing some intensive thing and you want to turbocharge it. And then other like fun things like uh, canvas rendering or game optimizations if you're writing like uh, web games um, and really any CPU intensive operations. Um, and I'll wrap up here by giving a shout out to this guy who I don't know except that his GitHub is awesome. Um, Austin Thoreau, I'm hoping. Um, and he wrote this like clever little project that literally only has 65 stars on GitHub called Handcrafted Wasm. It's super cool. I've communicated with him a bit and I'm gonna pull up his thing real quick here. Handcrafted Wasm. And I just find it incredibly inspiring. So this is all applications that he uh, hand wrote in Wasm. They all run into Canvas. And um, let's, let's open up a couple of these demos. So this is actually interactive. And I don't know if you can see it on those big screens, but each one of those is an actual particle that is getting generated in real time. Um, if, if, I don't know if any of you have done much uh, Canvas rendering, but this is almost impossible to do in JavaScript because of the garbage collection runtime. At random times, the garbage collector is going to pop in and be like, nope, need, I need the CPU cycles, and, and it makes stuff jitter. Um, but he can render thousands of millions of particles, really, with almost no performance implications. Here's uh, Conway's Game of Life written in Wasm with interactivity. I can move this around. I can come in here and change to these different variants. Um, and I have actually written this several times in JavaScript, and you do run into all kinds of interesting performance bottlenecks when you're trying to animate this much stuff this fast on a screen. Um, so this is one of these places where just uh, writing a little bit of handcrafted Wasm might, you know, might be a good, a good ticket. So like one question you might have is like, well, why not just write that in Rust? There is some advantage to actually handwriting the assembly where like you don't get any of the standard library, you don't get any of that additional uh, boilerplate that goes with it. You can literally write applications that are teeny, teeny, tiny. Um, for example, this one here without compression is 1240 bytes. Um, and it was, it was the entire game of life um, it, at, in high performance. And there's lots of these. I'd encourage you all to go check them out. Um, they're super cool. Okay, that's me. Thank you very much. You can follow me on some places.